Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, Havelians. Welcome to another Micro Haveli Free Session. I am Dr. Rohit Khadaukar, practicing microendodontist since the past 10 years in Mumbai, India and admin of Endo Haveli. As you all know, the golden rule of endodontics is about disinfection, debridement and three-dimensional obturation of the root canal system. However, there is a group of patients who defy this predictable routine and need a different treatment approach. So my session for today is going to be about the management of open apex cases and I will run you through the presentation as we go ahead. So before we discuss about the management of different situations, let's have a look at the various stages of root development. According to Swex classification, there are five stages of root development, where the first stage uh, is for about less than half of final root length, the second at half of final root length, third one at two third final root length, fourth at nearly complete root length formation, and the fifth and the last one at the closed apical foramina and completed root length. Now, during the formation of these roots, any time the patient can undergo a trauma or a situation which will require the treatment of the particular tooth. So there can be different causes of open apex, most commonly being due to trauma, due to which the, there is incomplete root development. There can be situations like dents in dente or Dentinal dysplasia, which might also present to us as open apex situations. Extensive apical resorption, which is seen in long-term chronic periapical lesions, can also have an open apex. Or cases where there is a surgical root end resection done without a proper obturation can also be situations where there is root closure has not happened completely. Uh, or cases where there is over instrumentation, which has been accidentally done by the operator. And now the apical foramina, which is constricted, has turned into a situation where there is a wide open apex. So there are different ways that you can categorize these open apices. The first one being a blunderbuss canal where you have a funnel shaped or a wide apical end rather than an apical constriction. Or you have cases where there is non-blunderbuss situation that is a cylindrical canal or a cylindrical root or cases where there is a wide root but which converges right at the end. So there is a criteria that we need to follow for assessing these cases of open apex situations. So the first and foremost thing that we need to do is the patient's symptoms uh, which would mostly be in the form of pain or some swelling or mobility associated with that particular tooth. There could also be some obvious signs such as a sinus or a fistula associated with the open apex tooth. Of course, it's the clinician's onus to also do a proper objective examination in the form of percussion, visual examination and thermal and electric pulp testing. Now, percussion is going to give us an idea whether there is apical periodontitis in that particular situation. Visual examination will tell us in cases of trauma if there is any discoloration on that particular tooth. Uh, thermal and electrical pulp testing are not very significant and not very conclusive in cases of open apices. Radiographic examination in the form of digital radiographs or CBCT of course is 
mandatory and that's when you will of course be able to see the open apex situation now there are different treatment modalities for cases which have an open apex uh, which are mainly dictated by the vitality of the tooth so if it's a vital case we would try and save the vitality by doing something like apexogenesis whereas in non vital teeth we need to do apexification so let's have a look at both these situations now apexogenesis is the attempt made by the clinician to try and continue the root formation so that the apical closure happens as it would happen naturally so the other word for apexogenesis is also maturogenesis which aims at completing the maturation of the root development in the particular case so apexogenesis aims at completing the root development for a favorable crown root ratio and at the same time preserving the pulp vitality to secure further root development and tooth maturation and also in the end our aim is going to be to promote root and closure similar to the natural tooth development there are three different ways you can perform apexogenesis procedures through either indirect or direct pulp capping and through partial pulpotomy so let's have a look at these three procedures in brief now indirect pulp capping has again the same aim that is to preserve the pulp vitality so we have to remove all carious infected dentin uh, place a capping agent to remineralize the affected dentin and try to simulate the underlying odontoblast so that a tertiary dentin or dentin like layer can be formed to seal off this carious portion now the indications of indirect pulp capping are mainly in cases where there is a thin residual dentin tissue which is less than 2 mm with normal pulp or reversible pulpitis now the indication for indirect pulp capping is for cases where there is a thin residual dentinal tissue less than 2 mm with normal pulp or reversible pulpitis an absolute contraindication to indirect pulp capping is in cases where there is obvious pulp exposure or signs where there is damage to the root already in cases like there is a root pulp. resorption or irreversible pulpitis or an necrotic pulp so diagnosis is very important before we take a decision on doing indirect pulp capping so we have different materials which are available for indirect pulp capping the oldest and the most reliable ones being uh, chemically set calcium hydroxide like dical we also have newer options like light cured calcium hydroxide uh, which act as cavity liners or mta or biodentin now the technique for indirect pulp capping starts with proper anesthesia isolation complete removal of the infected dentin which needs to be verified with caries detection dyes we also need to seal this affected or mildly discolored dentin with these capping agents and a layer of glass isomer which needs to be applied over this capping layer to seal and secure the capping layer a final restoration has to be done with a bonded restoration such as light glass. cured composite resin Uh, of course it is also very very essential that we take pre and post operative radiographs and periodically evaluate such cases to make sure that we are getting a proper success in case after doing this procedure the patient is developing symptoms in terms of pain or some discomfort a more invasive approach possibly a root canal treatment might be warranted let's come to direct pulp capping now the aim of direct pulp capping is also to preserve the pulp vitality and provide relief for patients with slight amount of pain or acute pulpalgia we also need to ensure the continuity of normal apexogenesis in the immature permanent teeth so the indications for direct pulp capping are teeth which are asymptomatic but have obvious deep carious lesions or there is a small possibly mechanical pulpal exposure while doing our cavity preparation which is less than 0.5 mm in diameter also we need to know clinically that wherever there is a pulp exposure the hemorrhage from the exposure site is easily controlled and the pulp is not hyperemic some contraindications for direct pulp capping 
are cases where there is a large carious pulp exposure irreversible pulpitis or there is a necrotic pulp already present the materials that are used for direct pulp capping include setting calcium hydroxide like dical mta and biodentin the technique for direct pulp capping is similar to that of indirect but in this situation when there is an obvious pulp exposure we have to check and make sure that there is a proper control of bleeding by placing a sterile cotton pellet in the anesthetic solution and applying a firm pressure to stop the bleeding and control it and we have to make sure that we apply a significant layer at least 2 to 3 mm of the capping agent followed by a protective layer of glass ionomer and a final restoration with a packable composite resin again follow up is necessary to evaluate the success of direct pulp capping and cases which develop symptoms might need root canal treatment as an intervention pulpotomy is another procedure which comes in the category of apexogenesis and this procedure basically aims at removing the exposed vital pulp as a means of preserving the root pulp or the radicular portion of the pulp so that the root development can continue now the indications of pulpotomy are when there is a mechanical or carious exposure especially in permanent teeth with incomplete root formation traumatic exposure in young permanent teeth with inflamed pulp is another indication in cases where you have pulpally involved permanent teeth in children or young adults where root closure is not completed or carious pulp exposures in asymptomatic primary teeth some of the absolute contraindications for performing pulpotomy procedure are in cases where there is irreversible pulpitis or the patient already complains to us of abnormal sensitivity to hot and cold or cases where there is chronic pulpitis or tenderness to per percussion or palpation uh, some obvious preradicular changes are seen on the radiograph or there is a marked constriction of the pulp chamber or root canals now the technique for performing pulpotomy again involves use of the same setting calcium hydroxide mta or biodentin the technique involves first giving a proper anesthesia isolating the tooth removal of complete infected dentin performing an access similar in situation when you would do a root canal treatment for instance and then you have an option of either doing a complete pulpotomy that is complete removal of the entire pulp tissue from the chamber of the particular tooth or a partial pulpotomy which involves just removal of the affected pulp tissue from only the pulp horn areas especially in posterior teeth again we need to control the bleeding that's happening from the orifices with a sterile cotton pellet soaked in an anesthetic solution and make sure that there is complete bleeding control prior to placement of the capping materials such as calcium hydroxide or mta or biodentin here we need to fill the entire pulp chamber with these materials and make sure that the material is sealed again with a glass ionomer cement this will be followed by placement of a interim material such as irm or with a final restorative material such as a light cured composite resin radiographs need to be taken at periodic intervals to make sure that there is proper success of this treatment if the patient develops symptoms after pulpotomy procedure is completed then root canal treatment might be warranted Let's have a look at this case of an MTA pulpotomy which was performed many years back where the patient reported to us with a history of trauma as you can see in the radiograph the deciduous lateral incisors have still not exfoliated and there is incomplete root formation in both the centrals although only one of the central incisors had a history of trauma and chipped incisal edge on that uh, mesial side so we did a pulpotomy and placed an mta as the material of choice 
that was followed by placing a layer of glass ionomer and the case was followed up for every six months and the results that you see are absolutely amazing. Just like the natural central incisor which is unaffected completes its root formation, in the same way the tooth where pulpotomy has been performed is showing signs of root development at the same pace. In the final follow-up radiograph that's available after two years, a uh, proper incisal buildup was completed and the tooth was uh, retained with its vitality. Another case of pulpotomy here where there is just the incisal edge that is fractured but because the patient was young the pulp horns are large that's why the chances of exposure are very easy in such situations. So we placed MTA again as the material of choice for pulpotomy. This case was done as a single visit procedure and a one year follow up shows excellent root formation and complete closure of the root apex and the root constriction. A magnified view here shows the preoperative situation at the apex where you have almost parallel internal walls of the root and as the time progresses you can see the root formation is completing and the tip of the root has completed its closure. And this is exactly the result that we are expecting out of a pulpotomy procedure. Now in a typical pulpotomy procedure, the expected treatment outcome that we wish to see is a heart tissue barrier that forms over the pulp, which can be observed in some cases as early as six weeks into the procedure. Apexogenesis or root completion may take up to two to four years. Pulpotomy is considered successful when clinically the tooth is asymptomatic without any tenderness or mobility. The periodontium is healthy without any signs of pocket or sinus. The tooth should respond normally to pulp vitality tests. Radiographically, a calcific barrier should be seen. There should not be any sign of root damage in terms of an internal or an external resorption. And the root formation should have completed along with the adjacent tooth or at about a similar or the same pace to complete the apex closure. So this was about the vital teeth and treatment modalities for open apex situations. So let's have a look at how we treat non-vital teeth. So they can be categorized depending on the age of the patient into either adolescent or young adults and adult patients who typically report to us with a discolored tooth and a history of a long-term trauma. Now in young adults, there is still a possibility that we can continue this root development by performing a procedure known as revascularization. However, in cases where the root development is incomplete and there is a history of long-term trauma, the chances of root closure are significantly less. So we need to perform a procedure like apexification or artificial barrier for closing the root apex. So let's have a look at how this revascularization procedure is performed. This procedure is typically done in cases where which present to us with an immature root and necrotic pulp in young patients where there is a possibility that some stem cells might be still viable in the periapical area. So what we need to do is change the environment within the root canal system by either having calcium hydroxide type medicament or triple antibiotic paste which is left in the canal for a period of two to three weeks after which we stimulate bleeding intentionally by over instrumentation so that the bleeding subsequently enters into the canal space and a blood clot is formed above which we place a sealing material such as MTA or biodentine. Now the blood clot acts as scaffold which also contains some of the growth factors and the stem cells and these in conjunction with the MTA is going to help regenerate the pulp and close the entire uh, root constriction like how it would have formed naturally. So the aim of this treatment is basically to try and strengthen this root and reduce the chances of further root fracture due to the thin root walls. So when it comes to apexification in adult patients, the current accepted treatment modalities are 
by either doing an obturation with gutta percha. So you have different options of gutta percha. Either you can have a chemically softened gutta percha, a rolled or inverted cone technique, or thermoplastic obturation with gutta percha. We can also use calcium hydroxide as a material for apexification. Or we have the newer generation of bioceramics, which is a broad category where MTA, biodentin, or bioceramic putty is involved. So we have a situation here where there are three different teeth which have undergone uh, possibly a history of trauma and the root closure has not been completed. So the question is whether we can use gutta percha as the obturation material in all these three cases. <clears throat> so a case where there is a wide open apex but a history of trauma uh, we have to make sure that there is a proper apical constriction or we have to mechanically create an apical constriction so that our gutta percha remains contained inside this particular tooth. So if you see this particular situation, the both the centrals had a history of trauma and there is a periapical lesion present on the right central incisor. So we did apical gauging and we saw that the apical exits were to a size of 70 and around 60 on the opposite central incisor. So accordingly we chose our master cones and on warm vertical compaction we realized that there is a possibility that might be a slight amount of root resorption at the apex of the central incisor which is the reason why you see a gross amount of sealer that's extruded. Now this may not be the ideal result so we need to follow up these cases over a long period of time and on a six year recall you can still see the sli uh, slight extrusion of sealer that has happened although in the other central incisor there is some amount of sealer that is got resolved in the body but if you notice periapically there is complete periapical healing which is a good sign uh, at the end of the treatment. A case like this which again presented to us with a history of trauma had a central incisor that was significantly wide in the root width but the apical portion was slightly constricted. So here also we chose to use gutta percha as the obturation material of choice and we used a core carrier based obturation to complete the obturation with a size 70 gutta core obturator. But what about cases like these where you have wide open apices which have walls which are either parallel or are blunderbuss canals. Surely gutta percha can't be used as a material of choice because we can't get a very good apical seal. So in cases if you try to do lateral con condensation you will always notice that there is a high chance that the gutta percha can be extruded and lead to a poor apical seal. So such situations warrant us to use a different type of material, not gutta percha, to create a pot proper and better apical seal. So let's have a look at the calcium hydroxide apexification procedure. So this involves use of either freshly prepared calcium hydroxide, which is available in the powder form, or we have commercially available calcium hydroxide, which is either water or oil based. In most of the situations, a water-based calcium hydroxide is preferable because this needs to be washed out in routine intervals and removed and replaced with a fresh calcium hydroxide. So the technique for calcium hydroxide apexification involves first doing a proper access cavity preparation, measuring the apical foramen or the opening at the end of the root, uh, establishing a proper working length, and doing minimal amount of instrumentation because these cases are already having a wide open apex. But what is important is to control the amount of infection by doing a proper irrigation protocol with sodium hypochlorite. Uh, preferable concentration for sodium hypochlorite is about 3% or slightly less than that, not a full strength 5.25%. Okay. Using lower concentration sodium hypochlorite is better so that there is less risk of any damage to the periapical tissues if there is accidental extrusion of sodium hypochlorite that happens during the irrigation procedure. We also use liquid EDTA 
to try and open up these dentinal tubules and so in terms of placing the calcium hydroxide paste lenturospirals or reamers can be used to place the freshly mixed calcium hydroxide into the root canal space of course with commercially available water based calcium hydroxide you have syringes which can be easily introduced inside the root and the calcium hydroxide can be delivered at the apical portion now in terms of changing the calcium hydroxide medicament there are multiple schools of thought uh, one of them being that we perform the procedure as a single visit procedure and a single time medicament change or some authors which recommend us to change the calcium hydroxide at regular intervals now we already know that calcium hydroxide has a very less amount of action which stays active for around 2 to 3 weeks and this is the reason why the calcium hydroxide needs to be changed at regular intervals ideally so that you can have maximum effect of the calcium hydroxide to try and close the root apex by the apexification procedure so there is also a waiting period of recommended about 3 to 6 months till we can see some signs of barrier formation on the radiograph so we need to also ascertain that there is a proper barrier formation over here for which we use a paper point to lightly tap at the apical portion and check whether we get a minor amount of resistance now it is important to understand that this barrier is not a very hard barrier that is formed it's usually something which uh, is having a lot of porosities so if you try and push the instrument such as a plugger or a very large file against this thin barrier there is possibility that we can break this barrier okay so we have to be very careful while we try to detect the barrier formation after which of course we can perform say a gutta percha obturation just like we discussed earlier now there are a lot of disadvantages of this calcium hydroxide apexification procedure primarily being patient compliance because the procedure requires multiple visits in most instances and you have to call the patient at periodic intervals to change the calcium hydroxide so it requires multiple visits and a lot of cooperation from the patient now some of the recent studies have also shown that long term exposure of root dentine to calcium hydroxide can be can make it susceptible to root fracture so it will be really unfortunate if the tooth or the root fractures before the entire completion of the treatment because the treatment took such a long time when we also see some of these patients which an open apex uh, with a history of trauma they mainly come to us because they have a discolored anterior tooth most commonly a central incisor and that is their primary concern in the early treatment phase now in calcium hydroxide apexification procedures the discolored tooth is given a least amount of importance because our primary aim is to try and complete the root closure so cases like these the patients have to wait for a period of around 4 to 6 months till anything related to aesthetics can be taken care of if you really look back into the amount of visits that are needed for doing calcium hydroxide procedure and the multiple times that we need to change the medicaments irrigate clean that area remove the old medicament uh, we also realize that there is a lot of time and energy spent by the treating dentist so it is sometimes not economically viable to do this multi visit calcium hydroxide procedure Because since calcium hydroxide apexification procedure is not 100% predictable there is a variable treatment time that's required for each and every patient that's why there is a range of around 4 to 6 months which typically is needed for calcium hydroxide apexification also at the end of this treatment there is an unpredictability or uncertainty of the apical closure so after 6 months if we don't get apical closure we are stuck with an open apex tooth that's what we started with right from the beginning so there is a huge amount of delay as far as the treatment results are concerned and sometimes this becomes a cause of concern in cases where we want to treat the situations much sooner so we have a uh, new 
option that's available for us today which is known as bioceramics now bioceramics is a broad term which can be applied to a category of biomaterials that are composed of ceramic as one of its constituents so the big advantage of bioceramics as is that they are bio inert bio resorbable and at the same time it is highly bioactive which is something that we need in such situations so mta is one of the most common bioceramic materials which i'm sure all of us are aware about okay there is also a calcium silicate based cement or a hydraulic calcium silicate based cement which comes in the category of bioceramics the big advantage of bioceramic materials is the release of calcium hydroxide and hydroxyapatite like compounds which perform an apatite layer similar to that of natural tooth structure so one of the first bioceramic materials uh, that is mta was developed in the year 1993 and it was launched commercially as pro root in the year 1998 so it's been many many years that this material has been successfully present in the market the initial phases uh, it was launched as a gray colored powder called gray mta but today most commonly you see white mta that's available for clinical use now mta as you know stands for mineral trioxide aggregate so it is a combination of tricalcium silicate and tricalcium oxide and silicate oxide some of the properties of mta are that it has a very low solubility a radio opacity which is much more than dentin so it's clearly visible on the radiographs it has an excellent sealability it is biocompatible and bioactive it has a very high ph similar to that of calcium hydroxide due to which it is also antimicrobial so let's have a look at how the mt epoxification procedure is performed after standard access cavity preparation we measure the apical opening with large hand instruments and establish a correct working length um there is again minimal instrumentation to be done here because we are already having a tooth which has a wide open apex in cases where the teeth are necrotic or there is a large periapical lesion we also need to control the infection by either placing a triple antibiotic paste or calcium hydroxide then there are different techniques which are available to introduce mta in the canal we will discuss about these briefly in terms of instrumentation since the tooth is already having a wide open apex standard instruments like 15 to 40 number k files probably might be extremely loose in such canals so we need to have a uh, armamentarium of large hand instruments to try and gauge the apical diameter of this tooth so after the 15 to 40 hand files you also have a category of 45 to 80 and that there is a third category of 90 to 140 so in open apex cases usually we need to also have this additional size of instruments in our armamentarium the focus of root canal treatment in such situations is not so much on the instrumentation but more on the irrigation and disinfection of such teeth so we need to use a significant amount of irrigation here but at the same time make sure that our irrigants accidentally are not pushed beyond the apex so when we use side vented needles we also need to use a proper stopper marked at least 2 mm short of the working length of the particular tooth also another important thing to note is that we use less strength of sodium hypochlorite compared to our regular 5.25% so 1% to 3% sodium hypochlorite concentration is what we need in addition to this some activation tools uh, will help i sometimes use this proxa brush in cases where there is a very less root length or my preferred technique of choice is to use sonic activation for activating the irrigant in the canal walls for placing mta inside the canal we also need a different set of pluggers which is going to be much more in diameter compared to the standard pluggers that we need for warm vertical compaction so probably we would need larger sizes or larger diameters of pluggers 
and at the same time longer lens as well so we have a set of pluggers which are available specially for the anterior teeth in large diameters starting from 50 which will go right up to about 100 or 120 at the same time we also can use paper points which are attached to a locking tweezer to use them as pluggers to try and condense or compact the MTA in place. The micro brushes which are used as tools for applying bonding agent for restorations can also be used to clean up this excess MTA along the walls after MTA placement has been performed. When I started placing MTA for the first time around 2007-8, one of the first problems that I realized is while using these pluggers or tools to pack the material, we had to first introduce the material somewhere in the chamber or at the orifice level and that was followed by trying to place and pack this material so that it reaches right at the apex. So there was a lot of material wastage and uh, it used to take a lot of time to get the material from the coronal aspect right up to the root. So that's when I developed uh, these carriers which actually helped me a lot to try and place the material right up to the apex without any wastage of the material. So it's been more than about 12 years now that I've been using these carriers and they have been used in most of the situations. And many of you all who are already using this in the group would vouch for this. Uh, I have also added a small description on how to use these carriers in clinical situations. So I just urge you to please go and click on the link and have a look at the description over there. So I'm just sharing a few of the cases which I have performed with MTA for apex closure. These were situations in which the patients have presented to us with a long-term history of trauma and a discolored tooth. So this was a 45 year old male who came to our clinic and uh, this is the situation that he came with. As you can see, there is a wide open apex and the roots are significantly thin. But there is no possibility that we can perform any other procedure right now to try and close the apical portion. So we used a barrier of MTA over here and the recommended thickness is about 3 to 5 millimeters. Although anything more than that is also fairly acceptable. Once the apical seal or the apical stop is created, we have now created an artificial barrier against which the rest of the gutta percha can be backfilled. So on a recall radiograph, which is followed up to three years, you can see the excellent healing and the maintenance of the apical seal that has done, been done due to the presence of MTA. This was a young patient on the other hand, who actually was undergoing orthodontic treatment and he had a history of trauma in the middle of his treatment. So a calcium hydroxide apexification was attempted initially but after about three to six months, there was no progress as far as the healing is concerned. So we decided to create an artificial barrier over here with MTA to close the apical exit. And on a one year recall, you can see that there is successful healing of that periapical lesion and regrowth of the lost bone. This was another case where we had just about a couple of weeks of time to treat this case and uh, that's the reason we did not opt for a revascularization procedure because it is a procedure which takes a lot of time and also requires a significant amount of follow-up so here this procedure was performed in about three visits where the first visit we placed calcium hydroxide in the second visit we placed the mta and in the third visit, the remaining portion of the canal was backfilled and the tooth restored. This was also a situation where we performed uh, MTA apical closure. So as you can see on the working length radiograph, the canal is significantly wide. The file that's placed inside is a size 140 number K file. So you can see compared to the file how wide the canal is definitely going to be. So this was more of a blunderbuss canal because you can see that the walls are slightly flaring out and they are not parallel uh, or tapering as you would expect normally. 
So here we had placed calcium hydroxide for two weeks as an intracanal medicament, which was followed by an apical closure with MTA and backfill for remaining portion of the canal. So over the years, I've got a chance to treat a number of such situations where the patients have presented to us with an open apex and most of them have been followed up to make sure that we have a successful healing in the end. Today we have a lot of alternatives to the conventional MTA also. Due to improvements in materials and handling, we also have materials which are available in a ready-made putty form or MTAs which are faster in setting or have slightly better handling or lesser setting expansion. But the gold standard still remains ProRoot MTA, which has maximum number of published research articles on the success rate of MTA in apexification procedures. We also have various bioceramic based sealers which are available today. They can be either a two paste form, a powder liquid form or single syringable sealers which can be introduced in the canal. However, there is less amount of research carried out in terms of their success rate as far as apexification is concerned. But they do seem to be a good viable alternative to conventional sealers because of the bioactive nature of the bioceramics. So to sum it up, a correct diagnosis is the key to treating cases which present to us with an open apex situation. A correct balance of knowledge and skills is necessary for the operator to treat the situation whether we need to do a conservative treatment or we try to do a regenerative treatment or to try and do a apex closure. Magnification also plays a key role in trying to disinfect these teeth and trying to place the MTA or calcium hydroxide in the correct position as is recommended. All in all, in the end, we also need to have a patient-centered and holistic approach to try and preserve the vitality of the tooth or to try and induce root closure wherever it is possible. With this, I would like to thank you for a very patient hearing and look forward to another session with you all soon. Thank you.